Hello, and welcome to Bibliophilia. I'm Becca Chavez, and today we're talking about Catch-22. All right, okay, welcome Becca. to the show. Here I am. Um, it's time to go, Becca. I know. I was like... Chop, chop. Sorry, I was laughing about our Kickstarter, which I shouldn't be what? doing. Right. Well, like, we can get back to that in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and um, by the way, I'm Scott Bergstrom. I am the sometime co-host of the show, although it's Becca's show, not my show. It's Becca's. Yeah. I'm just here a lot. So we are sponsored by Sexy Pizza. And we're having some now, actually. So, I mean, we're the pizza part. And it's really delicious. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're also sponsored by The Cruelty, which is Scott's book. That's my book, actually. You the sponsor Cruelty. Right. It's the, the It's the teen sensation that's taking the world by storm. And some uh, level. And um, some level. <laughs> <laughs> so we just did a giveaway on our Tumblr for uh, copies of The Cruelty. And those will be contacting people tonight to let them know that they won. That's right. And they are signed copies. So if you are selected... Uh, just give us a, a, a shout here at, what's our email address again? Bibliophiliapodcast at gmail.com. Bibliophiliapodcast at gmail.com. And uh, give us your contact information uh, and what message you'd like to say. Them on well, I know, I know. Tumblr. But oh, okay. what I'm saying is after you are contacted by uh, Miss Becca, be sure to include not only the mailing address, but what you want it to say. It makes a great, uh, a great gift. Yes. Oh, speaking of gifts, and this speaking is Speaking of gifts. You have a gift for me, and you kept on putting it into the outline, which I thought was... like I. That's right. I spaced it, and then I, I opened up, and it's like, hey, I've got a present. I've got a present, and I'm really excited now. So, uh, Producer Gabe, will you remind us when we're about... At, when we have like five minutes left for Becca to open the gift, but I'm going to... I have to sit in anticipation yeah, you this do. entire time. I'm not time. giving it to you right now. You have to wait. I'm going to pull it out of my bag, though. Hold on. This is... Oh, wow. It's wrapped in everything. It's wrapped in the only paper I had. Which is Hanukkah paper. Hanukkah paper. This cool. is the only paper we had around the house. So there you go. All right. um, yeah. So, so, Becca, what else is going on? We have the Kickstarter that I was laughing about when we came. Why were we laughing about it? We were we debating were... whether or not to talk about this. Can we talk about it? Please. <sighs> okay. So, yeah, we can talk about it. So, mix... so we started a Kickstarter. That's right. And then McSweeney's, those big copycats, were like, we're going to start a Kickstarter, too. And McSweeney's is totally ripping us off, man. Totally. They're just, ugh. They started Kickstarter. We're asking for $2,000. They're asking for $150,000. But how much have they gotten so far? Over $108,000. $108,000. That is, guys, McSweeney's does not need more money. We do not need more Michael Sarah literature (laughs) in the world. What we need is, uh, we need you to go to kickstarter.com and, uh, Support Bibliophilia Podcast because this is a fantastic program, which it needs to be mentioned, is absolutely killing it. We're doing really well. Yeah, we are getting a ton of listeners, a ton of downloads. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you can go to Kickstarter or Patreon uh, and donate a few bucks, fantastic. If not, thank you anyway for uh, listening. This is really exciting what's happening with this podcast, and it's all because of you. And I really, really like that we just try to basically run a smear campaign. Like people could only donate to one and they're going to pick us. That's right. So forget McSweeney's, choose Bibliophilia. And yeah. we, next week, we're going to start a Twitter war with, uh, with Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to cover his music on the show. That's right. Yeah. Um, we're going to try to get him as a guest on the show. Would you, would you listen if, if we had Kanye as a guest? I feel like that would be the meaning of the world. And it'd, it'd be fantastic. It would be. I it's, actually like Kanye. It's so. like what I, I – I love Kanye as well. And I thought when it was announced that he was marrying Kim Kardashian, I felt like we were, we were seeing this great convergence occur in the universe. Like the great forces of, of art and pop culture were suddenly coming together in, into one. I, it was very – it was – it, it was a marriage that had to happen, basically. And anyway. they're fantastic. They're really cute together. I will follow Kim on Instagram. <laughs> I know. And I, a lot of people gave them criticism for the name of their child, Northwest. I thought, w- what else can you name a child? Yeah. I mean, other than Northwest. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Anyway. Okay. We're not doing Kanye immediately because no. we've got some upcoming shows. Let's talk about those for a second so that people know what to expect in the next month and a half. So we're doing Catch-22 today. 
Next week, we're doing Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which is going to be our first nonfiction. The week after that, we're doing Far From the Matting Crowd, which is super romantic. Ugh. I love romantic things. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're doing um, Boy Snowbird by Helen Oyememi, followed by New Grub Street by George Gissing, and then Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood and Her Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And when does that take us through? That takes us to the end of June. To the end of June, and then we start again, and we'll be announcing as we come up with the roster for the next uh, month and a half what's uh, what's yeah. happening. We'll figure out what's happening. So, oh, so to catch twenty two, I have to confess something okay. about this book, which is that I I didn't read it uh, until I mean, wait, I read it. <laughs> I didn't read it until we had agreed to talk about it, though. So, in other words, for in my entire life. I've never, I've known what Catch-22 was, of course, as does everyone, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd never read the book. And I have to say uh, that this was the most brilliant and groundbreaking book that I've ever read that I also hated. I did not enjoy reading it. Uh, It's a tough one. It's very tough. And I'm going to be, I guess I'll be a little honest here. I read it originally about 10 years ago, and I loved it, loved everything about it. And then when I was reading it this time, I was having so much trouble just getting through it. I think part of it's kind of the joy of discovery of this book because it's so intricate. Yeah, this is a it is a radical reimagining of what a novel can be, and the reason is that it doesn't stick uh, in w- along a linear timeline. But there's no there's nothing groundbreaking there. But the idea is that it, it moves around in terms of large chunks of time where it'll go back for many chapters and then forward in time for many chapters and all, and then eventually coming back to the present, which in this case is 1943 uh, in uh, Pianosa, Italy, which is an island, uh, a fictional island in, um, in the Mediterranean off the coast of Italy. Now, normally at this point, we do... A two-minute... Well, I'm going to try to do the two-minute plot. All right. You try to do the two-minute plot, but it's just essentially so impossible like for a, this book. It is. Yeah. And I'm just going to give people like the basic kind of kind of attempt to do the background. So the the book follows the misadventures of John Yossarian, Captain John Yossarian. He was um he was promoted to captain after a bomb run that he did where his bombs didn't drop. So he went back to do it again and someone ended up dying and they promoted him as a result. They said this really looks bad on us, so what can we do to make it better? We'll promote you and give you a medal. Right. And um he Basically, you know, after this person died in front of him and another guy, Snowden, his basic philosophy is, I just want to live through this war. Like, it doesn't matter. Right. He said, Yossarian, I'm, uh, he's, his name is Yossarian. Yossarian says, I'm out. I'm done yeah. with this war. He doesn't want to fly any more missions. He doesn't want to do anything. But he can't get out of the war because of the catch, Catch-22. So the catch is that um, – the only way to get grounded for missions is to be insane. And you have to you have to tell the doctor you're insane and that you want to be grounded. But that small amount of concern for your own life is evidence that you are sane and so they can't ground you. Right, exactly. And that's what the catch in in the most specific sense, that's what the, the catch twenty two is. But as we'll yeah. see as we discuss this, there's some question as to what the true meaning of Catch-22 is, and whether or not it even exists as as a written-down law, which is a fascinating topic yeah. uh, in the end. and has to do with, it speaks to the core of the whole power structure of the world, really. I'm sorry, but I interrupted your no, two-minute plot. No, it's fine. Okay, so then um, he's basically decided he's not going to fly any more missions. Uh, and then this he's driving his commanding officers insane with this this I'm not going to fly thing. And he's like walking around naked and he's fighting people. He's constantly sick. He's in the hospital yeah. pretending to be sick. Yeah. Um, and then something happens. Another man that he works with, Nate Lee, Lieutenant Nate Lee, is in love with this prostitute who's only referred to in the book as Nate Lee's whore. Nate Lee ends up dying on one of the missions. And Yosarian goes to tell Nate Lee's whore that, that Nate Lee's dead. Because Nate Lee's promised to marry the whore. Um and she goes nuts and wants to kill him. She wants to kill Yosarian as though, like, he's the reason Nately's dead. Like, she, she doesn't seem – I think she does understand. I think she's just overcome with sorrow. That's that's for later. But um, – So she so keeps he, haunting him, She does. Yeah. And so part of the book is, like, him trying to escape her, him trying to escape his commanding officers who he views as the real enemy, enemy because they, they clearly want him dead. 
there's no other way around it. Um, <laughs> they keep sending him out on missions. And then um, just to not fly anymore. He just wants to be alive. And fortunately, at the end, he ends up driving people so crazy that they are going to send him home. And With one condition. That he talked nice about them. <laughs> that he's, such that, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that he liked them yeah. and, uh, and become their friend, right? So these guys who've been putting him into danger for years and years, their one condition for sending him at home is that he becomes their friend. And they want him to talk and say nice things about it. And he's like, I don't think I'm going to do that. And they're like, okay, well, just like us, okay? Now, if that's not complicated <laughs> enough, though, that is hardly the only story going on. There no. are over 50 named characters in this book, many of whom have their own chapters and sections that uh, where we see the story from their perspective. And they all have slightly different awful motivations for doing things. For example, Milo Minder Binder, who decides to, to use the war as an opportunity to profit. And uh, he goes about um, basically taking, uh, commandeering all of the resources he can and then uh, sells it back to the government. And there's a, w one of the most grotesque scenes uh, in the book comes at the end. So throughout the book, they're haunted. Everyone is haunted by the death of this um, young tail gunner named Snowden. Uh, it, it, we have to mention, by the way, that, um, that Yossarian is a bombardier uh, on, a, on, a, on a bomber in Europe during World War II. We missed that slight little point. Uh, but in any case, so he, um, they're, they're constantly haunted by the death of this uh, tail gunner named Snowden. I think Yossarian, really, because Yossarian, Yossarian is he's, really haunted. He's really haunted by Snowden. Stuff. And we, we only, and it's constantly referred to throughout the book, but we only learn at the very end of the book what happened to Snowden, and it, it is truly horrific. But as Snowden lay dying in the plane, um, Yossarian goes to find the, in, in the, into the medical kit to do what he can to help him and finds that the, that the, that, uh, the morphine packets that were in there were taken by Milo, who leaves this note saying, what's good for M&M Industries is, is good for us all. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had taken the morphine and, and um, basically left this poor young boy, Snowden, uh, with no means of alleviating his pain in his last moments. And it, it's, it's a truly grotesque uh, novel. And, and this, this book really uh, oscillates back and forth between humor and and horror. And and I think those are the two words to keep in mind as you read this. It's humor and horror. I personally don't think it was it was ultimately that funny in, in terms of laughing out loud, but it's that absurdist kind of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead humor, that um, Ionesco I, humor. I do remember when I first read it the first time, I do remember laughing. I, I actually remember that there's one page when he's talking about Snowden where I started laughing. It's when they're so Yosarians, they, they have these meetings to discuss things and anyone can come and ask questions. So Yosarian asks what happened to the Snowdens of yesteryear. And it's really sad and tragic. But then the the result of this, so I was upset and crying because it is sad. Uh, the result of this is that they're not going to have meetings anymore. And they're they're not going to ask people. No, they're not going to let people ask questions. And then because people aren't asking questions, why should they even have a meeting? Because they don't want to learn anything, so they cancel the meetings. Right. Basically, because of all this stupid bureaucracy, and I found that I don't know. I do remember, and I don't know if it was just that I was like so overcome with emotion for the whole thing that. But I it's was very so. A, a lot of the, the the humor, it's it's this very deliberate irony that it, yeah. that happens all all the time. You know, so a typical passage might read. Um, uh, he was the uh, most affable and friendly man and in the room and everyone always liked him. So obviously I hated him from the very yeah, first. That's you know, a... that kind of, it's that kind of one-liner style. And, and that's what happens constantly throughout the book. And that, it, and it, uh, to be honest, it grows a little tiresome after a while. Uh, but there it is. Yeah, I think that, I don't know, I kind of, I like it. I like so, it with the Texan. With so yeah, many characters, so, yes. everyone is going to have their favorites and their least favorites. Who are your favorites and least favorites? So my favorite is actually Nate Lee's whore. Um, <laughs> and you you went she's as... Not, you dressed I, up as her for Halloween one yeah, year, didn't you? Yeah, and nobody you? thought I was Nate Lee's whore. They thought I was like a military guy from World War II, which kind of 
is the point. Because she wears disguises to get to Yasarian. And she's always popping up. Yeah. In um, hallways with a knife. But I do like her. And I think, and I don't know if it's, um, I mean, she's one of the few female characters in this book, I guess. It's more fleshed out than some of the others for a lot. There aren't that many that are really... Uh, that that well, sustain, any. that really sustain throughout right. so Right, there's much a few the nurses. Book. So yeah. there aren't that many few. And I, so Nately's whore, I mean, he says he's going to marry her. And she seems really disinterested. And, and in fact, it's mentioned several times that she is pretty disinterested. And there's another guy who hates Nately who goes and continuously buys time with his whore. Because she won't let him hang out with her unless he pays because she's got to make money. It's a war. And so there's another guy who goes and consistently pays for time with his whore, with Nately's whore and then goes and, and rubs it in Nately's face. And I, I think it's it's worth mentioning if you haven't read the book that we're not being deliberately insensitive. Uh, that's what they call by her. calling her Nately's whore. <laughs> that's that's what they call her throughout the book. In fact, that's the she, only she doesn't way have a name. she's referred to. And then, uh, you know, even though she was kind of she seemingly, I guess, disinterested in some ways with Nately, when she finds out that he's dead... I just I just could relate to like her anger and why she's so mad. I think it's mis- misdirected completely to try and kill Yosarian because he he's the one that told her. And that's right, really and she's mad. he's ultimately not responsible, but he bears the burden because he's the representative of that world and everything that. And I think because she he's, hated, yeah, kind yeah. of compassionate too. I mean, like as a compa- he's constantly trying to. I I did see a lot of parts in the book where he was trying to make things better for people around him. Right. Trying to make things good. And I think that um, if you, like, for me, if I was a prostitute in Italy during World War II, and that's, like, the only thing I had going for me, and I'm trying to take care of my little sister because Nately's whore's kid's sister is a character in the book as well, and that's all she's referred to as. But um, she's trying to take care of her sister. And then this guy comes along who, for no reason whatsoever, seems to fall in love with you and is like, I'm going to take you home with me after this is over and things are going to be okay. And then you, to find out that, that that's all over. Like that's not. Right. I, can, I could really see where she was coming from, like that level It was this glimmer of hope that she had for the future, the post-war future that never seemed to come. And then to find out that, uh, that it's never going to happen. It's yeah. it's absolutely heartbreaking. So that's why she's really my favorite character. But you you like Doctor Nika? Well, so I, I want to qualify this. I don't like Doctor Nika, but I think <laughs> I think his psychology is is maybe the most interesting. So there's this doctor named Doctor Nika, and he is this horrible human being who um, he's a, he's a doctor. He's the physician for the unit, and he says that his most valuable medical instrument is his cash register. He, he wants to do two things. He wants to make money and uh, he wants to survive. And I think that this is a psychology that's that's really, this is in a nutshell, the American psychology. And that's it's quite tragic in that sense. Um, so he, uh, there's a couple of things that I have about him. So he tries to get out of being drafted. He, he loves the fact that the war happens because he has this failing doctor's practice in Staten Island. And then the, and he's, he's failing. And then the war starts and all of the competing doctors get drafted. And so suddenly he has all the business that he can handle. He writes his own draft deferment letter <laughs> saying that he's an amputee and that he has chronic rheumatoid arthritis. Is that and- I thought he had a heart condition. Oh, maybe I uh, I can't remember. I, I thought it was something like that. Because so. I think they just gave the number, and I'm like, I, I've known this number before, and I think it's in the cider house rules or something. So he he ends up not. Um, so the draft board doesn't believe him, and they come around to check to see if he really is an amputee or whatever his problem. And uh, he's insulted by the fact that they don't trust his medical judgment <laughs> on him to judge whether or not he's an amputee. And he gets drafted and sent to war. And he's a hypochondriac, and he sits around all day basically not doing anything, leaving the hospital that he's supposed to run to, to run itself and be mired in this sort of bureaucracy. And he doesn't care. Uh, he's and- got, like, there's two assistants that... But he's mad at the assistants because the assistants can't find anything wrong with him. Right, right. He's so. Yeah, they, they keep saying that he's okay. And he also... Um, has Yossarian um, fake his flight log books to include him on several flights because he gets paid extra if he flies a certain number, four hours a month. And uh, so he has Yossarian uh, and other pilots sort of log these fake hours in for him. 
Um, and then one of the planes crashes and uh, th that he's supposed to be on and he's not. Uh, so the military now thinks he's dead. And so they stop his pay. Uh, and his wife uh, is never heard from again because she, she now assumes that she's a, a, a widow. It's hilarious uh, in a certain manner of speaking. And that's the kind of humor that you find in this book. Yeah, I think that uh, there's another dead guy too, Mud. Yeah. Who's, who's consistently referred to as the dead man in Yossarian's tent. tent. And the problem is Mud never went to the, the place where he was supposed to check in. So they never had him as official member of the squadron. So they can't declare him dead in some sense. And it's like, so even though people are physically in front of you, you can't say, no, right. this guy's not dead because you would be acknowledging this error. And even though someone's obviously dead, you can't say, oh, this guy is is clearly dead because that would also be acknowledging right and this so, seems absurdist would, but you know but this losses. kind of things actually happen in real life and there's also this character when it, that that I just thought this was the most horrific thing um hungry joe who is oh, this God. this pilot who is through so many missions and uh he has these screaming nightmares at night um and he's just seen so much horror and can't believe that he survived through so many missions. And in the end, he dies by suffocating because a cat sleeps on his face. And, ugh, it's just it's, awful. I think that Hungry Joe is the first character in the book with easily identifiable PTSD. Right. And he's he's flown all the missions he needs to fly. And when he he applies to go home, he is told by his superior officer, Colonel Cathcart, that... Uh, he needs to fly more missions. The, the, the number of missions required is raised. Right. And so, so originally it's, and this is an important plot point that, that we should probably spell out. Because this is a catch-22 as well. Right. This is a, another catch-22 is that, so originally it starts off at the beginning of the war that if you fly 25 combat missions, you get to go home. But 40? the So the, it was raised to 40 okay. or, from a, the, an original 25, and it was raised to 40. And then as soon as someone would reach that number, and asked to be sent home, they would raise the number higher and higher until the point where it was uh, in the 80s. But it should be mentioned that it's not the Air Force doing it. The Air Force has it at 40, and Cathcart is the one who's like, right. oh, no, we're going to do more. The commanding officer uh, who keep, arbitrarily raises, a, raises the, the number. Yeah. So that's a catch. So they could request that the Air Force send them home with their 40 missions, but they'd be disobeying their commanding officer who's, right. who's telling them that they need more missions. Um, so they're stuck there. And I think Hungry Joe is the first one because he finishes, routinely finishes the amount of missions. And then as soon as he's done, the number is raised again. And he's the first one with PTSD. And I think Arfi has very, very serious PTSD. They go on this flight to this very this very dangerous mission called Bo Bologna. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I, okay, so they were going to go numerous times. And the first time Yossarian kind of gets out of it. And the second time they go, and they thought it was going to be a milk run, which means that it's going to be super easy. But it's not, and it's crazy dangerous. And Arfi just, I mean, reading that scene, like Arfi's just losing it. Right. Like he keeps going into the uh, nose, and Yossarian's yelling at him, throwing him out. And Yarfi, Arfi's like playing around in the nose of the plane where he's not supposed to be. And if anything were to happen, they wouldn't be able to get him out, basically. It's, it's like a safety issue, is my understanding. And what happens with this sort of undiagnosed PTSD where he has shell shock, uh, as they would say in those days, um, and basically goes nuts. At the end of the book, mm -hmm. uh, he, there's, so there's this, actually, one of the most beautifully written scenes, not just in this book, but really the most beautifully written scene that I've ever read. Um, uh, Yossarian goes to, Ro to Rome. Uh, he's, he goes AWOL, basically, absent without leave, uh, and he's walking around Rome as a conquered, devastated city. And it's this sort of cavalcade of horrors that he sees. Uh, there are rapes going on all around him. There's a soldier having a seizure. Uh, there are beatings. One man is beating a dog. Another man is beating a child. There's poverty, and it's 
an extremely poignant scene, and honestly, it's worth reading the whole book just to reach this. It's it's extremely touching. He's uh, trying to find but then Nately's kid's he's whore. He's trying to find, yeah, he's trying to find... Nately's whore's kid's sister. Right, to, so that he can rescue her. And they keep misunderstanding. He keeps saying, I'm looking for this 12-year-old virgin. I'm looking for this 12-year-old virgin. And they keep saying, oh, well, I'll get you a 12-year-old virgin. Don't worry. And it's it's absolutely disgusting. But so he ends up going towards the officer's quarters. And he sees the maid who cleans it, this young, innocent girl named Michaela, dead on the ground. She's been thrown out a window after Arfi rapes her and then feels he has no choice but to th- but to kill her uh, because he, because he raped she'd her. She'd tell. She'd tell. She'd tell. Right. That, and so he throws her out of a window. And Yosarian confronts him about this and says that he's going to prison. And sure enough, they hear the police coming, the MPs. And when the MPs enter the apartment, instead of arresting Arfi, they arrest Yusarian for being AWOL. And what's kind of amazing is like Arfi's reaction is just like, no one's coming for her. Yeah. No, she's just a servant girl. Yeah, she's just a servant girl. It's no big deal. You yeah. Know? And I think what's interesting is like, there are other times in the book where Arfi doesn't have sex with people. Like it's it's put into his, it's an option for him. And he doesn't, there's a countess and her, or a duchess and her daughter uh, who live above them in one of the quarters that Major mm-hmm. Blank to Coverly finds for them. And uh, he refuses to sleep with them. And then there's this other girl who everyone wants to have sex with and who's basically def- definitely willing. And Arfi, when Yosarian finds Arfi later, Arfi's like, oh, no, that was a, she was a nice girl. And I, we had right. a nice talk in the, in the cab. And I convinced her to change her ways. And for some reason, instead of taking all these options with these people who, who are willing to sleep with him, he rapes Michaela and kills her and there's no consequences and there's no consequences but it, but it's also important to remember that Arfi and this is not excusing his actions but he he became that person he became yeah. the rapist and murderer because of what happened to him because of his PTSD mm-hmm. and it's and seeing that alone is very horrific you know i think in this country especially we have this sort of uh, civic religion this civic narrative this idea that somehow World War II was the the last good war that America fought, that it was well-managed, that it was logical, et cetera. And this book really kind of blows the lid off of that way of thinking. Well, I think one thing that's important to remember, like when I read the book, because it is horrifying and it's sad and you're sorry and want out of it, but they don't really mention the Holocaust in this book. Like... It's not really well. Uh, well, actually, since it, it happens in 1943, they wouldn't have known about yeah, it. Yeah, so they. So I mean, like he doesn't know, and that's. A, I mean, that was. Yeah, he doesn't know, so they're not mentioning it because it's unknown, and so. Especially oh, with that, I see like, where you're going you with that. You don't know what you're fighting for, and would he have been more willing to fight if he was like, "Oh man, those people are really bad." Like, would he have, or would he? I and I think that's it. Like at one point in the book, he says. He just wants to get through the war, and he's like, a dead man doesn't care who wins. And he's tr- he, he's right. But, like, now we look at it, and we're like, it's it's a good thing we, we went there. Because right. what would have happened if we hadn't? What, what would have? And yeah. indeed, but but I, I think that one of the, the greater ideas here, and I think that this is, is really maybe one of the central themes of the book, it's that as an enlisted soldier, you actually don't have any say over your own fate. You can't choose or not choose to fight. And that's what is sort of the the big metaphysical catch-22, is that you are not an agent of your own will. You are a a cog in a machine that is at the military's disposal to do with as they wish. wish. You know, Yossarian put in his time. He did what he was asked to do. And it's these sort of arbitrary machinations of the commanding officers and 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 uh, forces that are much larger than himself that sort of conspire to keep him there. And that's really one of the great issues is that it's this individual facing uh, stuck in this machinery, and it becomes this sort of absurdist comedy that um, the things that he would do in normal life to ensure his survival actually work against him in the context of this vast military machine. Mm-hmm. And I think that the idea, too, of this this individual versus kind of society, I mean, it's a machine, yeah, but 
there there are a lot of points where the one of the reasons that I wanted to read this book was because when I was thinking about um a lot of the stuff happening, these riots that happened in Baltimore, I was thinking like a lot of the arguments against stuff like this is, oh, it's just one guy. This one thing happened. But then when you're like in that machine, when you're in that kind of it's difficult to explain to someone that they're trying to kill me when they're trying to kill everyone, right. you know? And that's something that's an actual conversation that's had in this this book where Yosarian looks at Clevenger and says, they're trying to kill me. And Clevenger's just like, they're trying to kill everyone. Like, what difference does it make? And I think, and and he doesn't care about the everyone. He cares about himself, which I think most sane people would be like, yeah, I'm concerned more with myself than I am with anyone else. And I think that's that's really like... The idea of do you give up that aspect of the self for the betterment of the whole? And, well, and I think you really run the, the risk. You the you you run the risk, right? You say I'm willing to risk my life for the betterment of the whole. But you know, these soldiers aren't signing up or they're not being drafted with the intention of becoming martyrs necessarily. Yeah. You know, they're willing to fight and risk their lives, but do they want to die? Not really. And I think know. also the fact that they're drafted and they're not, it's not right, like they're, exactly. they're optional. It's not like they're... This is not a... Uh, right, right, exactly. It's not like these guys are all gung-ho to go to war in it, the first place. They're drafted the and forced into it. beginning when the Osarian's in training, he doesn't... He tries to get out of it then. He's like, oh, right. if I just... Like the whole reason he's in Bombardier is because it's... The training was longer and he was certain by the time the training was over, he would... And he does his... Uh, he would not have to go to war. And even when he's even when he's in training, they're at Lowry Air Force Base, which is here. Which is here in Colorado. Here, That's right. Actually, in in Denver. Denver. Yeah. Um so they're at Lowry Air Force Base and uh he pretends to be sick and he goes and this is how he finds out about the liver condition. Like if he pretends to have a liver condition, they won't know what to do. So right. they just keep him in the hospital. Um but he goes to the hospital and there's a man there who, at one point, he's in the same room with the Osari. And at one point, the man jumps up and says, I see everything twice. And so all the doctors rush to him and try and figure out what it is. And they decide meningitis for no reason other than that the doctor seeing the guy is a meningitis guy. And um, they put him on quarantine. So that's two more weeks. And then when they come in to get him, he says, oh, I see everything twice. And... They quarantine them again, but the other guy ends up dying because Yasarian thought, like, this is a great scam we've been going back and forth. Right, right, right. That Yasarian thinks it's a scam, and he, he ends up— uh, It ends up the other guy actually had a problem. Right. But um, Yasarian did not. It's, so it's, it's kind of this— I want to bringing that up. The, the soldier who saw everything twice. I, I didn't know where to fit this into the outline, but I just want to bring up this point oh, yeah. now. So the, the, the book opens up with this scene where— there's this banter back and forth between Yosarian, who's a patient in this military hospital, and the other patients there. And they very callously start talking about this character known as the, the soldier in white. And yeah. it, it, he appears in the first chapter of the book, and then again later. And it, it just shows sort of this callousness that they, that they have that actually masks their true concern. So at the beginning, you just see them behaving callously towards the soldier. Basically, the, the case is that there's this soldier in the hospital who is covered head to toe in, in a cast, and he has only a hole for his mouth uh, that is, where he is, uh, and, and, and an IV going in. The hole for his mouth is so he can breathe and also so that they can take his temperature. And the soldier is there for a number of days, and one of the soldiers goes up and just has these chats with this this poor the Texan, the Texan, who goes up and has this these chats with the guy, and then one day they just find uh, that he's dead, uh, and that he's been dead for for some time, that his uh, not not for some time, meaning like for days, but he's been dead for at least a few hours and was just lying there the whole time with no indication. Yeah, and the, and this turns into this becomes sort of the butt of jokes, and it's an absolutely horrifying thing that they're talking about. But then later, Yosarian, it turns out, is very concerned. You know, he, he goes back and talks about the soldier in white later and what a horrific circumstance it was. So there again, we see this development of Yosarian, this guy at first that we think is just very callous, is in fact really covering a lot of things that he's feeling on the inside, yeah. you know, this horror for the, the And war. I think he is one of the more compassionate characters within the book. I think that's amazing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's... He is. Well, he's the, he's the one character that in the end 
tries to, and in the end of the book, they really do make him into be a hero vis-a-vis his resistance, his mm. resistance to the arbitrary authority of, of the state. And in the end, he runs off to, or plans to run off to Sweden and just disappear off the face of the earth. Because as we mentioned before, when they propose this sort of deal that he can go home as long as he likes them, he finds this essentially <laughs> unacceptable and he's unable to live up to it. And uh, he says, you know what, I'm not going to fake it. And he decides to, to run away. And thereby, he becomes sort of an example to the other uh, uh, airmen in his, in his unit to resist the authority. Yeah. Um, so some of the other examples of people, I mean, I feel like everyone's kind of in this weird way resisting authority in their own way. But you see- Every character in the book, you mean? Kind of. I mean, Dunbar, obviously. Dunbar's uh, friends with the Osarian. And you kind of start hearing something weird is happening. Like Dunbar goes down. And when they find Dunbar, they find him in this raft. And everyone who was with him is like, it didn't really seem like he wanted to find anyone. It was very weird that he had all these maps out and he didn't seem to be caring about finding our troops. And then in the end, Dunbar goes down again. And it's like they didn't have room or something. And he's like, no, no, come back for me. And so the idea is that he's in Sweden, that he, he right, right. took the raft to Sweden. Um, and that's what he was planning all along. So that's a little bit of a, a resistance. I mean, very planned, very AWOL. I mean, he'd get in a lot of trouble if he was caught. It, um, I wonder, though, it, can you categorize it? And I'm just thinking out loud here. Can you categorize it as resistance or can you – or do you have to say that it's just them trying to survive uh, in a way within the within the rules of this machine? For example, Milo Minderbinder, right, who uh-huh. becomes this uh, sort of entrepreneur and, and businessman. And he starts uh, appropriating all of this material to then sell. And again, he just sees this as an opportunity to survive and, and maybe – you know, make some money. Now you were, uh, it's interesting. You seem to have this in the outline. You had thought that there was some moral ambiguity with, with Milo. He, I think there are some, I think Milo doesn't really understand what he's doing. I don't think Milo understands. And I think that's part of like something he does to protect himself from what, what's actually happening. So, I mean, when we first meet Milo, he gives Usarian a quarter of a blanket. They've stolen someone stole a blanket off another man's um cot. Off another man's cot. Yeah. And Milo goes to find the guy and he tra- he doesn't really trade, but he gets the blanket back using some figs that Yosarian gave him. And um he gives Yosarian a quarter of the blanket. Milo takes a quarter of the blanket for himself and gives the guy back half a blanket. And the guy's like, what am I going to do with half a blanket? Because it's stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But at the same time, Yosarian's like, this is a really moral guy. Like, right. he's going <laughs> to he, stick to his guns. He equitably <laughs> yeah. distributed the blanket. Yeah. He gave it. Well, and so in, in that way, I – and then – there's this other. It's actually really kind to Major, 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 who no one likes. Right. There's a character. It, actually, you got that wrong, Becca. His name is his actual name is Major, 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 Major. It's four majors. Yeah. It's not so three majors. It's they, four majors. But you know, like no one re- use. Okay, so right. They just no call one really major, uses major. the right. middle name. I'm just joking around. Yeah, but yeah, he is four. But there's majors, and no one really likes him, and he does get the guy like lobster and do really nice things. But then he also bombs. He also bombs the whole place so um he bombs the battalion he bombs his own people right so that's the worst there's also um there's a scene where uh, right after well when usarian is in rome looking for uh nately's nately's whore's kid Kid sister sister, he goes to milo and says and try to tries to enlist him in this search for for the young girl and he yeah. has a friend in the um, – Milo has a friend on the on the Roman police department. And they go and he says, look, you have to help my friend out. Get your cops out looking for this young girl. And the police captain says, uh, I can't because I'm dealing with all this. I have to crack down on illegal tobacco smuggling. 
and Milo thinks illegal tobacco smuggling. Yeah, that's for me, you know. And so he, here he was helping Yossarian on this grand humanitarian mission. And then as soon as he hears that you can make a lot of money in smuggling tobacco, he leaves the room and just and, and walks out. Yeah. So I don't know. Like I think at the beginning he seems kind of moral, and then he took the morphine. He bombs his own people. He's just. It's definitely people profits over people, which we see a lot of. So. Now we see a lot of that now. So do you people. <laughs> do you think that we are? Uh, I don't know. Am I jumping too far ahead here to say that? Uh, what are real life catch twenty twos that we have today? Um. So oh, here's a good one. Entry level position must have three to five years experience. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> How right. the fuck can anyone get three to five years experience if it's entry level? Um. So I think that's a big one. Uh, the idea that. I think student loans are a catch-22 if you don't have money to go to college and people continuously tell you, like, college is a way to get out of poverty. Then you have all those student loans, so that's a catch-22. Right, and you graduate with six figures worth of poverty. So, yeah, that's <laughs> not really for you. helpful. Um, uh, there's uh, a couple other examples I was thinking. is it, oh, And you yeah, read about yeah. these cases from, from time to time of people who, like an old person who has their Social Security payments cut off, and uh, because the Social Security Administration thinks that they're dead. And then they call up and say, no, I'm quite alive. I'm right here. Yeah. And that alone is not sufficient to get it restarted. There's like months worth of, oh. uh, of, of appearances they have to do. And, and it's not just like a simple thing of like clicking it back on, like, oh, just unchecking a box. Yeah. They have to go through like court procedures to prove that they're alive. You know, but There was this really interesting case I read about a while ago where these girls like their parents were like uber homeschoolers and they never gave them social security they home birthed them and didn't give them social security they were completely off the grid completely off the grid and then when they turned like 18 or 19 they ran away to go live with their grandmother <laughs> and they had to establish themselves as human beings like because it was all connected to what? so did they have birth certificates Mm-mm. they had nothing what? wow i know crazy right so don't do that to your children. Get them birth certificates just just for courtesy's sake. Because <laughs> even if you're an anarchist, maybe your kids are going to have different beliefs. And so, you know, that right. might be... It might come in handy at some point. Later maybe maybe you'll need to be able to prove who you are. Yeah. So that's um, one. How about... Um, because you've listened on the outline, children put on no-fly list, but also Cat Stevens was put on a no-fly list. And that guy wrote Peace Train. And I just don't think... Yeah, but he also supported the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Did he? Yes, he was quite explicit. He said, yeah, the Ayatollah was uh, correct in uh, putting out a death threat on Salman Rushdie. He later, to his credit, uh, he later recanted. Yeah, and now he's off the no-fly list, so he can sing Peace Train in the United States. He's dead. No, he's alive. He's no. He had a tour last year. Oh, all right, never mind. I thought he died. See, I saw this thing about him recently. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, uh, Cat Stevens died. He's alive. (laughs) (laughs) He's super alive now that he can fly places. (laughs) So you know, one of the things, if we if we look at the if the the relationship of the individual to a, a vast organization, I, I wrote this into the thing and I skipped over it, but now I don't yeah. want to. Uh, what, if you look at the relationship between the individual and this vast bureaucracy, there's an important concept here that exists in political science, which is called legibility, and it's mainly a thing um, among anarch- anarchist thinkers. There's there's a great book that you should read called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. And, um, but one of the ideas is the idea of legibility, that these large organizations that or large, whether it's a government or a corporation or any sort of large organization, tries to impose order on sort of a freewheeling world out there. And that makes sort of rules of its own. And thus, it becomes possible for someone like uh, Yossarian, in this case, to encounter these catch-22s over and over again, where he becomes, uh, I don't know, help me out here, Becca, where he has to basically do things that would, in no, under normal natural circumstances, promote his life. But in this case, he is, boy, I'm totally lost here. I just keep digging myself into a hole. You know what I'm talking about, though? It's, um, it's, it's the idea that if I'm insane, that's a good thing. In other words, well, you have, yeah, okay. So this comes into the idea of sanity and like, how do you cope with something like this? Right. And the only way is to be crazy. 
kind of. And the only way, yeah, the only way is to be crazy. And yet the organization is itself crazy, you know? Yeah, it should have never been established in that manner. That's right. so maddening. Um, which reminds me of just of Kafka, which is just anytime right. you read Kafka, like by the end, if you're not oh. angry by the end of the book, like just pure frustration. Speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of Kafka, so follow my thought train okay. here. We talked about the peace train. Now we're doing my thought train. <laughs> So one of the inspirations for this book was another Czech the good shoulders, soldier, soldier shake, shake. Right. yes, which is not um, not widely read. I've here. taken multiple co- pictures of that book of like oh really, and it's on the Instagram. <laughs> you can see it's uh, so book. interestingly. This book is kind of it's relatively obscure in the United States, but in Prague, there's actually it's so popular that there's even a theme restaurant uh, where you can go, and there are characters <laughs> dressed up like Schweik, and they serve. Uh, the greatest Czech dish of all, which if you're a, a vegetarian, cover your ears at this point. They serve this suckling pig, which is like an infant pig, <gasps> right? With, I mean, it's the cutest little baby that's cooked. Oh. And it is delicious, <laughs> I have to say. It is horrible. It's enough to make you, you would become a vegetarian on the spot if it weren't so darn delicious. I had a very... Um, so this is, but this is a. I'm sorry. Where, where are we? We're where are we kind of talking about? about a lot of things. So this, sorry. good soldier, but good soldier shit. Just so everyone knows, is um, World War One. World War One, right? And it's by someone named Hashek. Is the last name yeah. Yaroslav Hashek? Yes, very weird name. Wow. But, so just if you are interested in knowing more, that'd be definitely something. You know, um, when this, do you know what the original title of Catch Twenty Two? Catch Eleven. No, it was Catch Eighteen. I thought it was no, Catch no, it was called Rule Eighteen. Well, that's not very catchy. <laughs> <laughs> it was called Rule 18. And then Leon Uris, is that how you pronounce it? Or Uris? Anyway, he came up with the, he, he published a book with the, with the number 18 of the title. And uh, um, Heller's. They changed it multiple yeah, times. Yeah, they changed it multiple they, they times. It, multiple it, was, times. it was going to be uh, Catch 14, then Catch, then Rule 18, and then maybe 11. What's amazing is that. This is such a part of, first of all, Catch-22 flows really well, I think. It does. It just flows really much better than Catch-11. But, and it's become such a word, like we know, what, even if you haven't read Catch-22, you know what a catch right. is. Right, everyone knows what Catch-22 is. Everyone knows what Catch-22 is. And it's become such a part of, such a part of us. Um, so we've got a little bit of time. Can we talk about what it means to be sane in society? I mean, we what talked does briefly, it mean to be sane? Who is sane in this book? Is the no, uh, like Clevenger? Maybe, maybe, maybe the chaplain. Do you think? Except he's an Anabaptist uh, minister. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, can who is sane and what what is sanity? And I think that's that's one of the big dilemmas of the book is that what defines it, what defines sanity, is that it's these contradictory rules that you have. Right. One, you have your your prime directive to ensure your own life, and then you also have the the bureaucracy telling you, no, you have to go fight, even though you've logged your 80 missions or yeah. whatever. So, you know, what is sane is th- the only sane course of action is to do what Yossarian actually did, which is fake his own insanity. That would be the ca- I, rational thing to do. I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't read the book and think of Yan- Yossarian as insane. Like everything he's saying makes sense. And like the other characters are kind of they're all insane. Baddie to me, like, right? They're all batty, but they all seem to be getting along way better than he yeah, is. Yeah, and, right? that and that's the, that's kind of the <laughs> and point. And I think that's like a thing too, with just society in general. Like, I don't know. I, there's a line in the symposium that I love so much. That uh, um, Plato is talking to the oh man. They're going to the symposium together, and uh, the guy's talking. And Plato stops and is like. Oh God, why can I not remember it? He's like, men of business, like you make no sense. And the problem is, uh, I can't even remember it. I feel so pathetic for not remembering it. Oh, that's okay. I have it somewhere actually. But it's about like, uh, men of business make no sense. Like none of, none of, nothing about business makes sense. It's not important in the grand scheme of things. But you think about people who are good at business, like Donald Trump is good at business on some level. But like, right. Like and so like is it crazier to be an artist? Is that somehow insane 
to like want to be an artist. I, you know, I think to like... some degree that that it is. You know, I mean, I'm sort of a perfect example of that. You know, I built, I spent a long time building a career in advertising and marketing, and I was a I was a creative director, which is a very you know, it's a good position to have. And I'm like, ah, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to become a novelist. And that, boy, was that a stupid decision to make financially, but it was <laughs> a brilliant That's decision to make uh, financial spiritually. decision. You know, well, you know, look, the things that we regard that that we think are virtuous, okay, intelligence, uh-huh. for example, creativity. These things are not often doesn't mean all the time, but it, they're not often rewarded. You know, the overlap between rich people that I know and smart people that I know is very little. You know, if you were to do a Venn diagram, rich people and smart people, the overlap, very tiny, very tiny. What it is, I see a lot of rich people that are great risk takers, um, but often phenomenally stupid. You know, like the risks that they take are stupid. And that's how they got their money, by making the bet that no one else was willing to make because they were too intelligent to do it. I'm not saying that as an insult. God bless them. But, uh, you know, it's just not, it's it's counter to the way you would want things to work in in, in an ideal world. Yeah. Oh, Becca. We're out of time. We're not out well, of time. No, quite, we're not. But it's, we it's present time. time. Oh, okay. It's I have... Pr- so it's I get to read this time. present. Right. It's heavy. So if you can't, you, if you're not watching this, if you're only listening to it, it's I, this I, lovely. What's that, Gabe? Yeah, it's. Yeah. A, it's <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all I had was Hanukkah paper. Uh, it's but, super heavy. Wait, I get to decide. That's the ripping of the paper, and I get to reveal. Let's see. Oh my God, it's Kim Kardashian's book. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I love Kim Kardashian. I know, that's why I got it for you. And the important thing to know is that Becca loves Kim Kardashian unironically. Yes, I just think she's- She's not ashamed of this love. Okay, on Sunday, I actually, when I go to my parents' house, because they have cable and I don't, I watch, like, Keeping Up With The Kardashians, I watch, like, three hours of it on Sunday. So this is a book called Selfish, and it's a collection- of Kim Kardashian's selfies. There she is with Kanye. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any Ray J ones in there? I doubt it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all from like fairly recently. Yeah, it's 2006 through 2014. Okay. Isn't so. that really like the dawn of the selfie age though would be 2006? Yeah. I mean, you couldn't practically you speaking do it prior to that. Then. Or whatever. Kim, I'm sure gets... Kim, I'm going to refer to her only by her first name, but this I'm book sure is she gets like really fantastic. I'm I was so actually going to sign Kim Kardashian on the inside. And I actually went so far as to try to look up what her signature looks like, That's, and I couldn't find. I anything. would have <laughs> been so disappointed when I found out it was a fake. <laughs> <laughs> she just got Chloe to sign it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked that. Chloe's in here too. That's all. At some point, you're going to have to launch an intellectual defense of why you like Kim Kardashian. They're not. I can do it right now. They're not. We've got eight minutes. Okay. They're not bad people. Like, here's the thing. Here's my big defense. If I were to have a dinner party and invite the Kardashians, it is more likely that one of my friends would offend them before the Kardashians offended anybody. They're like the least offensive people in the world. That is so brilliant. The, they're super nice. Even when I was watching, like for hours with my parents, at one point, my dad, who's like totally not paying attention, he's on his iPad, just looks up and is like, "Man, these girls are really supportive of each other." Because they are. They're constantly nice to each other. They're really supportive. Always telling each other that they look great. I mean, every once in a while, they fight like families do. Right. But like, they wouldn't be on the air so long if they were shitty, horrible people. You just would stop watching. That's why the Paris Hilton show didn't work out. That's why that awful, pretty wild show didn't work out. Because the Kardashians are fairly nice people, and they're just, I just don't understand why people are offended by them. Their job is to be reality TV stars. So before anybody says they don't have real jobs, their job is to be a reality TV star. you have to split a throat to get to the top. Is that what they did? I'm almost certain they had to do it. She thinks she wrote the back of Paris Hilton for a good long while. She was Paris Hilton's what? Uh, personal assistant. Personal assistant for a Was long she? Time. I had no she idea. She was. And she took the steps to become a socialite. And I'm pretty sure somebody's throat got slit on the way up. You think so? It has to. It's the business, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ron Al, just so people so, know. He's another producer here. So. But she, she's so, so you're <laughs> saying that the Kardashians are basically a benevolent force for good in this universe. They just don't... Uh, I just don't think... Aside from the person whose throat they evidently had to cut. (laughs) I just don't think that they've done anything 
I haven't seen them do anything really bad. And like, look at how they're supporting Bruce Jenner, who's obviously going through a huge thing. Like, how many other reality stars? Some reality stars make their money on being assholes to people right. who are different. And so, um, I think that's really great. Obviously, they care a lot about their family. I just don't think that they're. I just don't have a problem with Kim Kardashian like at all. We need to get Kim on the show. We should get Kim Kardashian on the show. She could. She probably. Gabe. Do you have her in the role with it? Can you, can you make a call? I thought iCannabis Radio was like huge. <laughs> we can actually probably get somebody who feels the contrary of how you feel about Kim Kardashian. We could have a big and argument. Oh. A great cat fight. A debate. Yes, I got boxing gloves and everything. Oh, oh you're talking about you. <laughs> I don't feel that they're as. I mean, there's some people who think that they're just dirty, rotten cunts. Yeah. And there's people who feel highly about them. Yeah. So I, we can probably arrange this. We can find something. We can arrange this. I know. We could lose brain cells if I listen to that show. The great Kardashian. I debate. love the Kardashian. And I, I don't mind. And I will. I want to say one other thing that, like, before the Kardashians came along, I think there was a standard for beauty that was very, very white, very thin. And, and uh-huh. Kim's got a lot of curves, and they've got dark hair and olive skin, and I love them for that. It, I didn't feel oh, that J Lo J Lo. J Lo, I didn't like J Lo. Did that twenty years ago, and I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> I guess you're right. I guess there's a whole, but I just feel that like the Kardashians. I guess because I think they're so nice, and whereas J Lo, I'm like, oh, J Lo. <laughs> but the Kardashians are seem nice and I I just feel like they're super pretty and they kind of change like how I'll say this is a valid argument all right it's a valid argument more young girls to read well Kylie and Kendall wrote a book I'm not gonna (laughs) do it on the show does this book does this book that I gave you does Selfish have any words at all in it Um, except for the title on the spine I'm obsessed with contour right there oh okay (laughs) Oh, I see. She captions some. So she does caption them. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, so it's a 300-page picture book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> of exactly. Kardashians. Of Kardashians, yeah. Of selfies, no less. Selfies. Oh, oh. my God. Oh. <laughs> All right. a seven-page pop-out book would have did the exact same. <laughs> <laughs> That's like fi- Brian's family guy, write it yourself book. <laughs> <laughs> Just like minimal effort. But... Thank you for the gift. I love this. So if you I tuned into this, this uh, podcast today to get <laughs> to find out about Catch-22, it's like a two-for-one deal today because we're talking about Catch-22 <laughs> and... Selfish. And Selfish by Kim Kardashian. Yes. And I, I think we did do it we in two minutes. We did do it in two minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, next week we'll be talking about Confessions of an English Opium Eater. That's which, right. Um. It's no selfish, but... <laughs> Which I am going to read this week. <laughs> How it goes. It, it ain't no selfish. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.